Ruby Neal Bridges was the first African-American child to desegregate the all-white William France Elementary in New Orleans, Louisiana, November 14, 1960. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can find more content like this at onemichistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so. My Patreon on my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. Imagine consuming 31 real whole fruits and vegetables every day. More nutrients from fruits and veggies can help our bodies with energy levels, strengthening our immune system, and so much more. Balance of Nature has taken 31 real fruits and veggies and powdered them into capsules locking in maximum nutrition. Try Balance of Nature with 35% off any Frisk preferred order, plus free shipping with promo code YES. Just go to balanceofnature.com and enter promo code YES to get 35% off. Give your body the natural boost it needs with Balance of Nature. Go to balanceofnature.com, promo code YES for 35% off. Ruby Bridges was born September 8, 1954. Bridges was the oldest of five children to Lucille and Avon Bridges. They were farmers in Tylertown, Mississippi. Both of her grandparents were sharecroppers. So in 1958, when Ruby was just four years old, her family moved to New Orleans, Louisiana in search of better work opportunities. Her father got a job as a gas station attendant and her mother worked nights to help support her growing family. Bridges was actually born the same year that the Supreme Court handed down its decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, ruling that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. Nonetheless, Southern states continued to resist integration, and by 1957, less than 2% of Southern schools were integrated. By 1959, Ruby was attending kindergarten at the segregated all-black Johnson Lockett Elementary. But by early 1960, however, federal district court judge Jay Skelly Wright ordered the New Orleans School Board to formulate a plan to integrate their public schools. And New Orleans School Board chose to integrate two formerly all-white schools, William France and McDo Elementary, in the fall of 1960. Spring of 1960, the school board created an entrance exam for African-American students to see whether or not they could compete academically with the white students. Those that were chosen and passed were allowed to attend the white schools. The test was written specifically to be difficult so the students would have a hard time passing, with the idea being that if black students failed the test, New Orleans might be able to fend off integration a little while longer. Bridges lived just five blocks from William France Elementary, but she had to attend kindergarten several miles away at Johnson Lock Elementary. Initially, Bridges' father was averse to his daughter taking the test, believing that if she passed and was allowed to go to the white school, there would be trouble. However, her mother pressed the issue, believing that Bridges would get a better education and be allowed educational opportunities that her parents had been denied. She was eventually able to convince Bridges' father to let her take the test. Her parents were informed by the NAACP that she was one of only six black children who were able to pass the test. Two other students decided not to leave their schools at all, and the other three were sent to the all-white McDo Elementary. Bridges would be the only African-American student to attend William Frentz Elementary and the first black child to attend an all-white elementary in the entire South. However, September of 1960, when the first day of school rolled around and the school district was still dragging its feet and Bridges was still at her old school. During this time, the Louisiana State Legislature found ways to fight the federal court order and slow the integration process. After exhausting all of their stalling tactics, the legislature had to relent and designated that schools were to be integrated November 14, 1960. Fearing that there might be some issues, Federal District Court Judge Wright requested that the United States government rush federal marshals to New Orleans to protect the black first graders. November 13th, Ruby Bridges' mother told her that she would be starting a new school but didn't explain the complexities of the situation, only stating that you don't need to be afraid that I'll be with you. On the morning of November 14th, federal marshals drove Bridges and her mother the five blocks to school. While in the car, one of them explained that when she arrived at school, the marshals would walk in the front of Bridges and two would walk behind Bridges. When Bridges and the federal marshals arrived at school, large crowds were gathered out front yelling and throwing objects. There were barricades set up and police were everywhere. Bridges thought that the crowds were there for a Mardi Gras celebration and the image of this tiny little black girl and her escort of federal marshals calmly walking through the crowd of rabid segregationists spread across the United States. The crowds made her think that this was an important place and Ruby initially thought that she was in college. 
when she entered the school under the protection of federal marshals, she was immediately escorted to the principal's office and would spend the entire day there with her mother. The chaos outside and the fact that nearly all of the white parents had kept their children home and all but one teacher had stayed home in protest of desegregation meant that she had no classroom to go to. Many segregationists simply withdrew their kids from the school permanently and even at home after the first day, police set up barricades at the end of her block and only local residents were allowed on her street. On her second day, it was very much like the first. For a while, it looked like Bridges wouldn't be able to, to attend class. The only teacher, Barbara Henry, was willing to teach Bridges. She was from Boston and a new teacher at the school. Bridges was her only student in her class because all of the parents had pulled their children from Bridges' class. By November 5th of 1960, only 18 students attended class at William France Elementary. Ruby Bridges' mother would sit with her through her entire second day of school, but after that, Ruby would have to attend school alone. Barbara Henry was very supportive of Bridges, not only helping her with her studies, but also helping her with the difficult experience of being ostracized. Ruby Bridges would later state that Barbara Henry was the nicest teacher that she had ever had. Ruby's first few weeks at William France Elementary were not easy ones. Ruby sat with Miss Henry as mobs of protesters roamed the streets attempting to throw rocks and bricks at passing cars. White segregationists left burning crosses in black neighborhoods as a warning, and some parents even traveled to Baton Rouge to attempt to have federal judge Jay Skelly Wright removed from office. Ruby was confronted several times with blatant racism. On the second day of school, a woman threatened to poison her, and on another day, she was greeted with a woman displaying a black doll in a wooden coffin. After this, federal marshals only allowed her to eat food from home, and she would recall that this was the only time she was actually frightened. Ruby would spend her entire day every day in Miss Henry's classroom. She was not allowed to go to the cafeteria or out to recess with the other students because it was deemed too dangerous. And when she did go to the bathroom, federal marshals would walk her to the restroom. Despite these hardships, she never missed a day of school. Several years later, one of her escorts, Federal Marshal Charles Burks, would comment with pride, talking about Bridges showing a lot of courage. She never cried, she never whimpered. She just marched on like a little soldier. After winter break, though, Bridges would show signs of stress. She was experiencing nightmares and would wake her mother up in the middle of the night. For a time, she had stopped eating her sandwiches that her mother packed for her and would hide them in the storage cabinet in her classroom because she wanted to eat with the other students. Soon, the janitor discovered it because it was covered in mice and cockroaches, and the incident led Miss Henry to start eating lunch with Bridges in her the classroom. Ruby would also start seeing the child psychologist, a Dr. Robert Coles, who volunteered to provide counseling her first year of school. He was very concerned about how such a young girl would be able to handle the pressures that were being placed on her. During the sessions, he would just let her talk about her experiences, and later on, he wrote a series of articles in Atlantic Monthly and eventually published a series of books about how children handle change, including a children's book on Ruby Bridges' experiences. The abuse was not only limited to Ruby Bridges. Her family suffered greatly because of their decision to integrate William France Elementary. Ruby did not notice at the time, but her parents were also afraid for their lives. There was a very real possibility that they could be lynched by the mob, but they never communicated this to their kids. Her father also lost his job at the filling station, and her grandparents were sent off their land they had sharecropped for over 25 years. The grocery store where the family shopped also banned them from entering. However, many in the community, both black and white began to show support in a variety of ways. People across the country sent in money and gifts to help and the neighbor provided Ruby Bridges' father with a job. Also, volunteers helped babysit the other four children. Some even walked behind the federal marshal on her trips to school. Ruby Bridges would even receive a letter from former first lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Near the end of the first year, things began to settle down. Gradually, families began to let their children go back to school, and the protests began to subside as the year went on. Occasionally, Bridges got to go outside and visit with some of the other children. By her own recollection, many years later, she was not fully aware to the extent of racism that had erupted over her attempting to attend a segregated school. But after another child refused to play with Bridges because she was black, she slowly began to understand. Ruby spent the entire first grade year receiving one-on-one -on -one instruction from Barbara Henry and being escorted to and from school by U.S. Marshals. But the following year, everything had changed. 
The school had become further integrated. Miss Hinton's contract had not been renewed. She and her husband moved back to Boston. There were no more federal marshals, and Bridges walked to school every day by herself and attended class with both black and white children without incident. No one talked about the previous year, and everyone seemed to want to put last year's experiences behind them. In 1963, painter Norman Rockwell created Bridges' monumental first day to school in a painting. It's called The Problem That We All Live With, in the image of a small black girl being escorted into school by four large white men graced the cover of Look magazine, January 14, 1964. 1995, Robert Henry contacted Bridges and they reunited on The Oprah Winfrey Show. In 1999, Bridges formed the Ruby Bridges Foundation headquartered in New Orleans. Bridges was inspired by the murder of her youngest brother, Malcolm Bridges, and a drug-related incident in 1993. For a time, Ruby Bridges looked over Malcolm's four children, and they all attended William France Elementary. She soon became a volunteer there three days a week and became a parent community liaison, which by that time was a majority African-American school. Ruby's experience as a liaison, she began to see the need for parents to take an active role in their kids' education. So Ruby Bridges launched the foundation to promote the values of tolerance, respect, and appreciation of each other's differences. Through education and inspiration, the foundation seeks to end racism and prejudice and its motto is racism is a grown-up disease and we must stop using our children to spread it today ruby bridges is still an outspoken civil rights activist and an icon of the civil rights movement she has published several books and especially wants kids to learn to be kind to one another she states that there's a message that it often leads with kids is that racism has no place in our hearts and minds of children if we're going to get past our racial differences i believe it's going to come from our kids what I find is that my story resonates with kids. They put themselves in the shoes of that little girl and they understand the loneliness and they understand someone not wanting to play with them. And I think they get it. Thank you. This has been a story with Ruby Bridges and I'm your host, Country Boy. If you like stories like this, you can find more stories like this at onemichistory.com. Also, if you like to support the channel, you can do so on my Buy Me Coffee on my Patreon page in the description below. Give us five thousand Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.